small places close to home conversation about human rights in the United States. Inspired by the words of Eleanor Roosevelt, who is the principal architect of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, who drove the international campaign um, to secure adoption of the Universal Declaration. She believed that its real impact should be, as she said, um, in small places close to home. She asked, where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world, yet they are the world of the individual person. Um, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm, or office where he works, such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Governor Roosevelt also understood that human rights, whether civil and political or social, economic and cultural, are really interdependent. So for example, violations of uh, women's reproductive health rights can result in de facto violations of other rights, such as the right to privacy, the right to life, the right to education, and the right to non-discrimination. So at the Human Rights Institute, our mission is to make Georgetown Law a premier training academy for the next generation of human rights advocates. And after the Supreme Court decision in Dobbs, we feel that um, the need for really passionate and confident human rights lawyers in this field could not be stronger. So it's our hope today that um, the expert panelists will impart some of the knowledge, skills, and expertise um, that will bring us a little closer to the fulfillment of reproductive rights in the United States. Um, so I wanted to introduce our co-organizer of this important discussion, Professor Sarah Bosha. Professor Bosha is the director of the Capacity Building Initiative at the O'Neill Institute and a visiting professor of law. Her work focuses on health, gender, and human rights, and in particular on advancing accountability and justice for violations of the right to health. Prior to joining O'Neill, Professor Bosa worked as the Global Health Research Specialist at the University of Notre Dame, where she taught courses on health and human rights and ethics in global health. And on behalf of the Human Rights Institute and the O'Neill Institute, I'm really pleased to welcome you all today to this important discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for your kind words uh, and echoing her welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, the O'Neill Institute was founded in 2007 with a vision to build a global cohort of health lawyers from around the world who use the law to deal with or to address the world's most pressing health concerns. The right to health, principles of equity and justice underpin the work that we do at the O'Neill, which focuses on areas as diverse as addiction and mental health, infectious diseases, access to medicines, and also the evolution of the legal landscape to respond to emerging health crises. Our O'Neill experts are leading thinkers in the world and they contribute their time and knowledge to also teaching and mentoring our LLM students in our two flagship LLM programs, the LLM in global, national and global health law that we host or we present together with the Georgetown University Law Center and the LLM in global health law and governance that we provide and offer in partnership with the Graduate Institute in Geneva. We are so proud of our health lawyers who have gone on to do amazing work uh, in different spaces, such as the World Health Organization, UNAIDS, uh, health ministries, and other government agencies. When the decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization was handed down, many feminists, many women's rights activists knew that it was more than just an affront to abortion rights, but really a violation of the whole gamut of women's rights. Commenting on the leaked Supreme Court decision in May 2022, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, Dr. Tlaling Mofo King, said these words, which ring true today. The court in this decision would give legitimacy to an ever-growing anti-women's rights and anti-equality movement that is bent on stripping women of bodily autonomy and dignity. And that's what we have seen happen now. 
This particular event is important because it seeks to highlight other so-called unintended and unforeseen impacts of the Dobbs decision on women's health rights, particularly sexual reproductive health rights. But despite the sadness of the moment when Dobbs was handed down, this also presents a moment in time for the US movement for women's rights to rebuild and regroup and provide stronger legal protections for the right to abortion and the range of women's rights and sexual reproductive rights. Leading us in this important and timely conversation is um, Katie Keith. She's the director of the Health Policy and Law Initiative at the O'Neill Institute. She focuses on providing technical assistance to policymakers and public education on health policy and legal issues with a strong focus on access to coverage, affordability, transparency, and equity. She's also the co-founder of Out to Enroll, a national initiative to connect LGBTQ plus people with coverage options. And she's appointed a representative to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. I just wanna extend my thanks as well on behalf of the Human Rights Institute and the O'Neill Institute to the other panelists for making the time to have this important conversation. And thank you all for coming. And I'll hand over to you, Katie, to introduce the rest of the panelists. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I could not think of a better welcome and opening and a, I think a real clarion call uh, that very much addressed, I think, the hard and challenging moment we find ourselves in. I think all of us read the headlines of what's going on with women's health care in this country, um, new states and new restrictions coming on board all the time and what it means. And so I could not be more honored or privileged to moderate a discussion with such incredible rock star women on this panel to explain some of the international <coughs> rights implications, and really, I think, reframe, certainly for me as someone who maybe focuses on more domestic health policy, reframe sort of the urgency and the legal obligations uh, post-ops in, in a new and unique way that I think uh, the O'Neill Institute and the Human Rights Institute certainly offer here. So uh, I will introduce folks in a second. I think in terms of housekeeping, we have uh, many people in the room. It's an excellent turnout. I'm so pleased to see how many folks are here. We will be taking questions, uh, both from those of us, from those of you joining remotely and here. Uh, we're going to start with some excellent presentations from our panelists. And so please, you know, we encourage a lot of discussion and please have those questions ready uh, and bring them for the end. So without further ado, um, I'm very privileged to Privileged to introduce uh, Rebecca Reingold, who's Associate Director of the Health and Human Rights Initiative at the O'Neill Institute. Uh, Rebecca's going to explain to us today, sort of ground us in the framework for international human rights law, why it matters here in the United States, post-ops, and what some of these state restrictions that we've seen really mean in the United States, dogs, and, and what sort of obligations they might trigger. Uh, we will then hear from Sylvia Serrano, who's also an Associate Director at the Health and Human Rights Initiative. She's going to bring what I think are uplifting and hopeful uh, lessons learned from a uh, community she's been working with in internationally, um, and hopefully some things that many of us can take away for organizing and legal arguments in the United States. And then we'll wrap up with Susan Crocken, uh, who's a scholar at the O'Neill Institute as well, uh, and is going to talk about assisted reproductive technologies, which is an area of her expertise for a very long time, and really dig in, I think, on some of the unintended consequences. So it's a rock star panel, could not be more delighted to be here, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Rebecca. Uh, thank you, Katie, and hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Yeah, let, let me know if it drops off at all. Um, for the intro and then to Sarah and Michelle for, for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here. Um, so I actually may switch up the order a little bit uh, in terms of how I'm going to talk about the, these, these different issues. I think I I'll start first with an overview of where we are in terms of state restrictions in the U.S. following Dobbs to kind of lay the groundwork, what the current context is. Then move on to the U.S. obligations under uh, related to abortion under international human rights law, and then reflect on how Dobbs and the state's regulation of abortion following Dobbs um, result in possible violations of uh, these different obligations. Um, so where we are in terms of uh, state abortion laws post Dobbs, um, in terms of abortion bans, uh, we have 14 states that currently have complete abortion bans in effect, um, and three states uh, where abortion bans with gestational limits well before viability or in effect, uh, that which can range from, from six weeks in Georgia to 18 weeks in Utah. Um, and then in an additional nine states, we have courts that have blocked similar types of abortion bans, uh, which means they prevented them from going into effect. But they tend to have similar characteristics to the ones that are currently in effect. 
Um, in terms of what these abortion bans allow, uh, only about, in terms of exceptions, um, only about half of these total or near total abortion bans, whether or not they're in effect, have exceptions for the physical health of the pregnant person. And only about a third um, have exceptions for rape and or incest. Um, I would say that, that most folks read all of them to include exceptions for the life of the pregnant person. Um, in terms of enforcement, uh, the bans subject doctors, health providers to harsh civil penalties, which can include fines up to $10,000, criminal punishments, um, and suspension of medical licenses. Uh, one state imposes a maximum penalty of life imprisonment, which is Texas. 11 states impose penalties of up to 10 to 15 years in prison. And another 11 states impose penalties of one to six years. Um, at least three states authorize citizen enforcement of abortion laws, um, which has received a lot of attention in, in the news. Texas was the first to adopt such a mechanism, which empowers private citizen, citizens to sue health providers. And then we have at least two states laws that apply to anyone who aids and abets an abortion, um, which can include physicians, but also family members, Uber drivers. And I think we've even seen language indicating that people who in any way financially support an abortion, so donating to organizations that support abortions could potentially be implicated as well. Um, but this is all related to abortion bans. Um, there are a number of other abortion restrictions that um, have existed long before Dobbs that have limited uh, women and pregnant people's access to abortion services um, at the state level for, for many years. Um, and those different restrictions have been litigated in the courts over the years with, with different determinations about which ones are constitutional and which ones aren't. So even in states that don't have bans, restrictions have for many years made it very difficult for women, particularly marginalized women and pregnant people, um, to access safe and legal abortions. Um, and examples of the different types of categories of those restrictions can be restrictions on the types of procedures that are available, um, restrictions on abor abortion medication and how it can be provided, restrictions on health professionals and health um, institutions that provide services, restrictions on women's decision-making, pregnant people's decision-making around accessing abortion, and then restrictions on funding for and insurance coverage of abortion. Um, and in terms of what the impact has been, um, again, the news has covered this pretty extensively, uh, but state bans are already affecting access not only to abortion services, but a range of other essential health services. Um, and examples include miscarriage management, management of other inevitable pregnancy loss. So that can be ectopic pregnancy, premature labor, and pre-viable pregnancies, cancer therapy, and then we'll hear a lot more about uh, the potential implications for assisted reproductive technologies. Um, and then the last thing to note is that we know that these bans and other restrictions are having a disproportionate impact on certain groups of women and pregnant people. Um, they disproportionately affect low income individuals um, and they disproportionately affect people of color who are more likely to lack health insurance and face barriers to seeking care outside of their states if they live in a restricted context, um, whether it's time off of work, childcare, travel costs, things like that. Um, we also know that state bans are predicted, are predicted to increase pregnancy-related deaths, whether or not they're, they're tied to um, an abortion, um, and that racial disparities when it comes to maternal morbidity mortality and morbidity in this country are already significant. Um, so state abortion bans are um, having a disproportionate impact on, on people of color, their reproductive health outcomes, and also other groups of already marginalized women, like young people, young individuals, survivors of domestic violence, immigrants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's just a little bit of where we're at in terms of the laws and, and the impact. Um, in terms of the US's obligations under international human rights law, I think many of the folks here have, have some knowledge of the limitations of um, that framework within this country because while the international human rights law community has um, said a lot of really um, progressive things about what is permissible under the international human rights law framework when it comes to abortion, the, the scope of the, the, 
that framework's uh, authority in the U.S. is limited by the fact that the U.S. has only signed on to a handful of international human rights treaties. So international human rights bodies have said that restrictive abortion laws violate a range of human rights, right to health, right to life, privacy, freedom from gender discrimination or gender stereotyping, freedom from gender-based violence, freedom from ill treatment, among many others. Um, but, the, but the U.S. is a signatory only to a handful of, of treaties, um, which don't cover all of these rights, including the one that we spend a lot of time talking about at O'Neill Institute, the right to health. So they have, they have signed on to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, um, which obligates the U.S. to protect and preserve a range of civil and political rights, including the right to life, dignity, privacy, and equality. Um, they've also ratified the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, um, which protects individuals and groups from discrimination based on race, whether it's intentional or the result of seemingly neutral policies. And then finally, it, it, they have ratified the Convention Against Torture, which um, obligates the U.S. to prohibit and prevent torture and cruel and human or degrading treatment uh, or punishment in all circumstances. Um, I'll just mention two other human rights treaties that are very important in, in work on abortion, but that the U.S. has only signed but not ratified. So the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, um, the U.S. signed in the 70s but has yet to ratify, has uh, articles that address the right to health, um, and then we have the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDA, uh, which the U.S. signed in 1980 but has yet to ratify. Um, and it's one of only seven countries in the world that hasn't ratified that, that treaty. And there are articles on non-discrimination and access to healthcare services, as well as the right to um, choose the number and spacing of, of one's children. Um, and then finally, a third one is the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which the U.S. signed, but again, didn't ratify. And the U.S., I think, is only one of three countries that, that hasn't ratified that, that um, treaty, which has articles addressing the right to privacy and, and also the right to health. Um, and by not ratifying treaties, they're technically the, the human rights obligations included in those treaties are not binding upon the U.S. Um, so looking a little bit more at the three treaties that the U.S. has signed and they're the bodies that monitor their implementation, um, the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights has the Human Rights Committee that supervises states' compliance with their obligations under that treaty. Um, and they have um, a general comment, 36, a relatively recent general comment that addresses in particular the, the right to life, but connects it with other human rights um, included in the convention. And there's some really strong language about um, abortion restrictions. Um, so the, the specific rights though, in general, that the con convention touches on related to abortion or right to life, right to liberty and security of person, to privacy, to non-discrimination, and the right to be free from cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. And so in this recent general comment, um, the, the committee addresses um, all countries who are signatories obligations related to abortion in two ways. One, it establishes that abortion restrictions must not jeopardize women's and girls' lives, subject them to physical or mental pain and suffering, discriminate against them, or arbitrarily interfere with their privacy. Um, the Human Rights Committee also says that countries must provide safe, legal, and effective access to abortion where the life and health of the pregnant girl or woman is at risk or where carrying a pregnancy to term would cause the pregnant woman or girl substantial pain or suffering and then notes specifically cases of rape, um, incest, or where the pregnancy is not viable. Um, and then on the other hand, it establishes that countries cannot regulate abortion in a way that drives women and girls to seek unsafe abortions, um, which can also result in the violation of these human rights. So it says explicitly that countries should not apply criminal sanctions against women and girls undergoing abortion or against medical service providers for assisting them in doing so, since it can drive women to seek unsafe abortions. Um, and similarly, countries should not introduce new barriers that hinder women and girls' access to safe and legal abortion. Um, under the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and its um, implementing committee, uh, we have Article 5 that requires countries to undertake and prohibit, um, to undertake to prohibit and eliminate racial discrimination in all its forms and guarantee everyone 
various rights, which include the right to public health, medical care, social security, and social services. And just last month in, in August, um, the U.S., the completing observations for the U.S. Um, came out from, from the Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And as part of those completing observations, um, which look at the country's compliance with their obligations under this treaty, um, the, the committee underscored the fact that systemic racism has a profound effect on women's and girls' ability to access sexual and reproductive health services in the U.S. Um, and urged the U.S. to take all necessary measures to address the disparate impact of the Dobbs decision on certain groups of women and girls. So it specifically calls out its concern for the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling in Dobbs, um, saying it overturns you know, 50 years of protection of women's access to safe and legal abortion, um, and then the profound disparate impact that that has on racial and ethnic minorities, and particularly those with low incomes, and the disparate impact of the legislation and other measures that have come out of the state level restricting access to safe and legal abortion or criminalizing abortion. And so they, they recommend that the US take all necessary measures at the federal and state level to address this, this profound disparate impact of jobs um, on women of racial and ethnic minorities, but also indigenous women, those with low incomes and provide safe, legal and effective access to abortion in line with international human rights obligations. Um, and so it, it also talks a little bit about the risks that um, health providers who assist women in accessing abortions face and to ensure that they are not subject to criminal penalties. Um, and then finally, the, the Convention on um, Against Torture, their implementing um, body, the Committee Against Torture, has said in a number of concluding observations for various countries that um, denying or delaying safe abortion or post-abortion care causes profound physical and mental suffering and traumatic stress, which can amount to cruel and human integrated treatment. Um, so then turning to, you know, how these different human rights obligations, uh, you know, apply to the, the state laws we, we've seen come down, um, there are a couple of ways in which the U.S. is violating obligations under the um, ICCPR. Um, they have avoid, they have basically, what the Supreme Court has done is afford, afforded states complete discretion regarding how to regulate abortion, which means that states can now adopt abortion bans without key exceptions such as risks to the physical health of the pregnant person and cases of rape and or incest, which the Human Rights Committee has says are part of um, their obligations to uphold a very, various rights under that treaty. It also means that um, states are in a position to adopt bans on abortion, which we know drives women and girls to unsafe services, unsafe abortion services. And the discretion afforded to states in this area also constitutes a violation of the U.S. obligations under the right to privacy, also included under the ICCPR. Um, state abortion bans and other types of abortion restrictions strip pregnant people of their autonomy, their agency, and their capacity to make informed decisions about their health and lives. Um, and then forcing pregnant people to carry pregnancies to term under very difficult situations, such as when there are significant um, health risks or following a rape, and this can cause the, the type of pain and suffering that can amount to cruel and human or degrading treatment under not only ICCPR, but also the, the Convention Against Torture. Um, and then finally, the disproportionate impact of state abortion bans on various groups of marginalized people um, and women who can, uh, is a clear violation of the right to deny discrimination, which we see under various human rights treaties. Um, and it very much lines up with what, what the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination said just last month. Um, and these are the groups that even before Dobbs faced the greatest number of practical obstacles and structural barriers to accessing safe abortion services. So we, I'll just end by saying that the devastating consequences for people of color in particular is particularly pronounced because in the US we know it's only gonna exacerbate um, existing disparities in the area of reproductive health and health in general for these groups. And I think I'll, I have some comments on limitations around enforcement, despite recognizing these obligations, but that's great. Thank you so much.
Yes. So I will I will focus on how um, Latin America and the United States are going in opposite paths with respect to reproductive health and abortion. Um, and uh, to that end, I will first present a very brief overview uh, of the legal status of abortion in Latin America, and then I will discuss five reasons that, in my opinion, explain uh, the different paths that um, that also can give some. Uh, piece of, uh, some peace of mind to Latin American advocates, and that could also be useful as lessons learned from Latin America to the United States for a change. Um, so I will start with the with the context and the legal uh, about the legal status of abortion in Latin America. Yes. So in in Latin America, we have um, three different models um, related to abortion. Uh, the first one, which um, has only a handful of countries, El Salvador, Republic, uh, Dominican Republic, Honduras, for example, they have a total ban model, um, but those are just a handful of countries in Latin America. Uh, the second model is the exceptions or the grounds model um, that in, it, it depends on the country. Sometimes it includes um, gestational limits for some of the grounds and sometimes it doesn't, but the general grounds that are included in those models are um, cases of rape, rape incest, um, cases of risk to health or to the life of the, of the pregnant person, or cases of um, lack of viability of the fetus. Um, and the third model is a hybrid model, uh, which includes the exceptions uh, model and also the, um, um, a number of weeks in which uh, anyone can access to an abortion without arguing any type of ground. And uh, those in that uh, third model, the gestational limits uh, ranges between 12 weeks in Mexico City and some states, uh, some other states in Mexico, uh, also in Uruguay, 14 weeks in Argentina, and 24 weeks in Colombia. Um, and despite the, however, despite the, the recent legislative and judicial progress in Latin America, criminal law is still extensively used with regards to abortion, and that's a reality. And, uh, and to make sure that I'm not romanticizing uh, the Latin American context here, um, it, it is good to have in mind that with these uh, three models, um, the legal status of abortion in Latin America is in general more restrictive than it was is uh, uh, in the US under Roe v. Wade. Uh, but the trend seems to go on the, in the opposite way. And uh, now I move to the, to the second part um, in which I would like to underline, and these are not, this is not an exhaustive list of course, uh, but I would like to underline five uh, factors that in my opinion are contributing to the progressive decriminalization uh, in Latin America. And not only those factors um, um, isolated, uh, taking into account in an isolated uh, way, but uh, the interaction of all these five factors in Latin America. Um, the first uh, factor that, um, that I wanted to underline is um, that the constitutional basis for the protection of abortion is stronger in Latin America. Um, it, is, uh, it is not a secret that uh, our constitutions tend to include a, lo a long list of rights, including not only civil and political rights, but also social rights, such as the right to health, and um, that in the context, in the specific context of abortion, it means that reproductive autonomy and abortion are not only matters of privacy. Uh, they are matters of privacy and autonomy, but also it is a matter related to the right to life, to be free from cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment, to dignity, to health, to equality and non-discrimination, and another specific feature of um, most of the constitutional, the Latin American constitutional frameworks is that with respect to social rights, including the right to health, there is um, strong acceptance of the non-retrogression principle. Um, for example, in the United States, what just happened with Roe, it's uh, a retrogression in terms of access to healthcare, but this is not an argument uh, that one can expect to be taken seriously at this point uh, because of the status of social rights in the, in the United States. Um, so that's the first factor. The second factor that I wanted to underline is that in Latin America, 
um, international human rights law is relevant and it has an actual impact. Um, and that, uh, and this is very related to, to Rebecca's presentation that can take uh, different forms, this relevance of international human rights law in Latin America. Uh, the first one is um, the, the, the most obvious one, the ratification of a wide number of international human rights treaties that, that create legal obligations. Um, the second factor is that those international legal obligations are part of the domestic legal system. So it's not exotic to argue before domestic courts, uh, um, legal obligations are based on international human rights treaties. It's not something weird or uh, unusual. This is something that uh, happens in, in the every day of the litigation and the judicial practice in Latin America. So it's not only that uh, Latin American countries tend to ratify more international treaties, but also that those international legal obligations are part of the domestic legal systems, and sometimes even at the constitutional level with the same hierarchy of the, of the constitutional provisions. Um, another um, dimension of this relevance of international human rights law in Latin America is the ratification of protocols or the declarations uh, to those treaties allowing for stronger mechanisms of supervision, specifically allowing for the presentation of individual cases before treaty bodies or before uh, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Um, so it's not only that Latin American states ratify the, the international, tend to ratify more international human rights treaties and that those legal obligations are part of the domestic legal system, but also they are not um, that suspicious to those more, uh, to those stronger mechanisms uh, of supervision, such as the individual cases before uh, international bodies. And all of these, uh, the, the mix of, of these factors um, creates a context of a stronger use of international advocacy and international litigation on the part of civil society in Latin America. That results in recommendations or orders, depending on the, on the specific mechanism, but recommendations or orders that are at least that are more likely to be taken seriously by national courts, but, or at least that they have a chance of at some point being taken seriously by uh, domestic courts. Um, the third factor uh, that I wanted to underline is, um, it's related to the, to the first one and the second one, but I wanted to give it a special um, space in this presentation, uh, which relates to how, um, the legal frameworks in Latin America are more strongly committed to substantive equality. Uh, and this is very important um, in, the context, uh, in the context of abortion. One expression, expression of this is that um, in Latin America, equality and non-discrimination provisions, um, first, all the, all the dimensions of equality and non-discrimination have constitutional protection, which is a factor that uh, is different here in the United States. Um, and particularly, the, there are strong constitutional protections against disparate adverse impacts of apparently neutral norms or practices. Uh, as you know, in the United States, not only disparate impact claims don't uh, have a constitutional uh, protection or cannot be based in the constitution, but on the, on the statutory provisions, but also the Supreme Court of the United States has managed to create a good idea with Greeks, but then to wreck it with uh, making disparate impact, impact claims very, very difficult to, to, to have success here in the United States. Um, so in the, the fact that uh, the legal frameworks in Latin America are more open to uh, substantive dimensions of equality and non-discrimination, including uh, disparate adverse impacts uh, on vulnerable groups um, has been key specifically uh, for, the more, um, for the more recent uh, progress in Colombia and in, in Mexico. Um, and it's not only about the, as I mentioned before, not only about the, the level of protection of some dimensions of equality and non-discrimination in Latin America in contrast to the United States, but also that courts um, in Latin America tend to be less suspicious about substantive equality and about non-neutral reparations, for example, um, uh, as it happens in, in the United States. And it, if it happened with the 
uh, previous composition of the Supreme Court. We'll see uh, what will happen with disparate impact, impact claims with this uh, composition of the court. Um, but I just want to clarify that I'm not naive about this because it seems like I am defending Latin American frameworks as the best uh, in terms of abortion and in terms of constitutional provisions and ratification of treaties. I, I understand that the human rights record with or without uh, great constitutions and great international treaties is far from ideal in Latin America. I know that, but in this context, it has had an impact in the context of, of reproductive health and abortion. Um, the, the fourth factor that I wanted to mention is uh, the role of data in recent processes that had a uh, huge success. Uh, and I wanted to focus here on the, on the case in Colombia. Uh, this year, in February 2022, the Constitutional Court of Colombia decriminalized abortion up to week 24. Um, and it maintained uh, as a hybrid model, it maintained the exceptions uh, without any uh, gestational age limit. That decision was the result of a huge um, legal and social mobilization named Causa Justa or fair cause or just cause, or I don't want to use that translation because of the invasion to Panama that had a similar name uh, on the part of the United States, but um, Causa Justa was the name of that movement that ended up in this um, groundbreaking decision. And um, after reading that decision many times, the, the judgment of the Constitutional Court of Colombia, um, I find more ways in which the data that was collected was relevant and was determinant for the result. Uh, I just wanted to mention with this slide some of those um, topics in which data was absolutely key uh, for the Constitutional Court, for the decision of the Constitutional Court, uh, data regarding insecure abortions and maternal mortality, including the prevalence of this phenomenon, but also uh, who are the ones more affected by insecure abortions and, and maternal mortality. Uh, data regarding criminalization, the use of the, the actual prosecutions against um, women, uh, what groups of women are the ones that are more likely to be prosecuted, um, and uh, the role of intersectionality in this uh, data analysis. It's the poor uh, women that tends to be more um, uh, exposed to uh, prosecution and um, conviction. Um, another type of data that was very relevant was regarding the barriers of access to legal abortions. Who are the women who are more likely to face factual barriers even in the previous um, model of, of grounds or, or exceptions. Um, another uh, component of the relevance of data was how the data showed that bans and prosecutions uh, don't prevent abortions. They just don't um, uh, prevent or uh, change the number of abortions that are being performed. So that data was very relevant for the Constitutional Court that said that criminal law is not complying with its preventive role in the context of, of abortion. Um, and the other component of the relevance of data uh, in this case was, um, in contrast with the previous one, the data on the efficacy of alternative measures to prevent the real public health problem that we have here, which is unwanted pregnancies. Um, so these data, um, this data, and these are only examples, there are more examples on how data was very important in this case, in the litigation and in the decision, in the reasoning of the Constitutional Court, but it, this interact with some of the issues that I mentioned before. Um, these data was important because the legal framework allowed for this type of arguments, because the legal framework allowed to, for allegations of disparate impact of the crime of abortion. So this, this is an example of the interaction of all these factors. Because, we, because in Colombia there is a um, legal, legal framework that is more open to this type of claims, this type of disparate impact, impact claims under the constitution, then this data was absolutely relevant for the decision of the court. Um, and the final um, uh, factor um, is the role uh, of social mobilization in, in Colombia. Uh, in Colombia and in, in Argentina, uh, with the legalization up to week 14, and in Mexico, the, the trend that is taking place right now, covering um, an, an increasing number of states. 
um, the role of social mobilization. So gathering support, social support for the cause, not only creating great legal arguments and not only um, using the international human rights law framework and not only uh, gathering data, but also gathering social support to the cause. Uh, that happen in different in different forms. That happen in forms of protest, communication strategies, um, which uh, are intended to uh, not only a legal but also a social decriminalization strategy to taking of stigma, uh, taking stigma out of of, of abortion. Um, and I just no, I'm, I'm done with the time. Uh, I just wanted to underline that these factors are uh, that uh, the. In my opinion, the key for the success was the interaction of all these factors, not in each of these uh, um, isolated, in, in, yeah, considered in an isolated place manner. Thanks. So I have so many questions of my own. Uh, we will defer to others. Um, we'll turn over to Susan. And I know we are getting some questions from remote listeners. Again, for folks in the room, if you want to be teaming up those questions, we'll turn to that soon. So thanks. Susan, to you. Yeah, I'm just turning on my timer and waiting for the slides. Um, so in the interim, I would like to just move to let America from here because it seems like a lot better. You don't have to romanticize it the way things are here. Um, so first of all, Thank you for the opportunity to join you all here and to talk about things that I am worried about on a sort of more granular level here in the US. Um, the question that I put up was, you know, how might Dobbs and state laws impact ART, assisted reproductive technologies? So I'm sure all of you are familiar with what the court said, um, which sharply distinguishes the abortion right is that it deals with potential life and the life of an unborn human being, and that is unique. The question is whether or not it is unique in the context of IVF and vitro fertilization and more broadly, the assisted reproductive technologies. The court said that abortion is sharply distinguished, but I think the question we're all looking at from my lens is, does that really not impact IVF embryos? The dissent was a lot more realistic and a lot more um, contemporary, if you will, and talked about the court may face questions about the application of abortion regulations to medical care that most people consider not to be relevant or directly related to abortion, including the morning after pill IUDs. And they said specifically and explicitly in vitro fertilization. And I'm sure you're seeing the news articles that you know there are women who are being denied DNCs for medical miscarriages, including the death of a Missouri woman last uh, few weeks that I heard about. So can I have the clicker? Is this great? Okay. All right. So a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, what I want to do here in my couple of minutes is frame the issues for you, put IVF and ART in the legal context pre-Dobbs, and then talk to you about some of the things that some of us are worrying about the Dobbs impact is going to be. And a lot of that is speculative, some more immediate, some less. So there, this is some photographs of embryos. So just to give you all a context, the thing you're looking at that looks like a new moon is an egg being fertilized by a sperm in nature. Okay, the sperm is burrowing into the egg with its head first. The second one, which looks like um, to a round thing in the middle, that is a pipette on the left holding the egg so it doesn't move while a hollow needle on the other side is injecting a single sperm into the egg. That's IVF as it's currently practiced using something called ICSI, intocytoplasmic sperm injection. It is the most efficient way to get a sperm into an egg to fertilize it. And one of the big questions in this field is, you know, does life begin at conception, fertilization, et cetera? So I want you to see fertilization. It has been described as a chaotic process. It doesn't happen in an instant. The next picture is an embryo that has developed for a couple of days and it's having PGT performed on it, which is pre-implantation genetic testing. And that is a pipette pulling out part of the cell structure in order to test what is removed to tell you whether or not that embryo is affected. For example, cystic fibrosis, et cetera, before a decision is made whether that embryo should be implanted into a uterus or not. The last picture on the top is a, that is a needle. And that needle on the tip of the needle is an embryo that is now at the eight cell stage, probably three or four days old. So that's the size we're talking about. It doesn't mean it's not important, but that just gives you a little bit of context. So that's how fertilization fits into this picture. 
Below that is a photograph of embryo tanks. This is where IVF embryos sit. This is where frozen eggs sit. They're inside of lots of different things, straws, et cetera. But those are the actual tanks. And then next to that is the picture of what I think a lot of us fear is the way of the future, which is this notion that life begins at fertilization and everything in those tanks is a human being, a person entitled to full protections vis-a-vis -vis any uh, pregnant person who might carry them eventually. So um, we don't need to go through this slide in any detail. What I wanted to do was just contextualize for you all where IVF developments fit into the legal context that we had. So we wrote a book called Legal Conceptions and it's placing IVF in a legal context. So what you see in the first four or five bullets is the developing law pre-Dobbs of reproductive rights, right? We had a right not to be forcibly sterilized, a right to contraception that belongs to individuals. And in 1973, obviously, Roe v. Wade, the right to an abortion and that a pre that there is not a right to, um, you know, that a, per, that a fetus is not a person. 1992, obviously, we cut back. But what was relevant here is that IVF didn't exist when Roe v. Wade came down. In fact, it was nothing more than a glimmer in the eye of a bunch of researchers at that point. And in 1978, 1981 are the first IVF babies born in the world. Louise Brown in the UK, and then the first in the US was Elizabeth Carr at a clinic in Norfolk, the Jones Institute, that was picketed by anti-abortion advocates um, when it opened. The 1980s, a second really important development in IVF happened, which was cryopreservation. It's a really fancy word for freezing, okay? It's been improved upon, but freezing did this amazing thing, which is it meant that you could put things into a freezer and you could fight about them from a legal perspective for a very long time because no one knows how long an IVF embryo is good for. Their kids who've been born 24 years after the embryo from which they came was frozen and then thawed. Um, it forced courts to relook at reproductive rights long before Dobbs. And it, frozen embryos became a flashpoint for a lot of people. It, um, in 2012, and this is the last sort of uh, date I wanna put out there, ASRM, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, which is the medical community, finally lifted the experimental label on egg freezing. We've been doing egg freezing for a long time, but it took the, the medical community a while to say, you know what, this is safe, efficacious, and it's not experimental crazy stuff. Um, so 2022, we all know the Dobbs case hit expressly po um, overruling Roe and Casey. And the question is, what does it mean for embryos? So there are three cases I want to mention really, really briefly. The first is the seminal, let, let me back up for just one second. What I have said for years and which feels so prescient now is that, you know, unfortunately is that there are three things about IVF that uniquely challenge um, American reproductive jurisprudence. The first is we fertilize outside the body. The second is we cryopreserve so we can fight for a long time. And the third is that we introduce third parties into the process, meaning sperm donors, egg donors, embryo donors, and surrogates. And so we've got to worry about the rights. What Dobbs is doing, I think, is more impacting the first two of those elements. And I'm going to talk about those. And then I think there's, a, there's also going to be third party impact, but it's more attenuated. So the Davis case was the very first time that there was what do we call a divorcing embryo dispute. Husband and wife were fighting over, they were divorced, they no longer wanted to use the embryos in the freezer. And the question was, who gets to decide what to do with them? The wife wants to use them, the husband wants to discard them. And what the court said is that what they called a pre-embryo is not a person, not property, but something in between because of its potential for life deserves special respect. Notwithstanding that characterization, in the absence of a prior agreement, the right not to procreate trumps. And Junior Davis, the husband, got to go through with the discard of his embryo. So here we have special category. We're not going to treat them just like the coat in the coat room at the restaurant that you forgot. But it doesn't mean you can't discard them. That's because the couple didn't have an agreement. There have been over 20 cases since then in which high state courts have ruled on this question. And the interesting thing is no matter what theory they come up with, property, marital properties, persons, et cetera, none of them have thought it appropriate to force procreation, usually on the divorcing man who no longer wants to be a father. And they've gone so far as to say, this is not amenable to judicial enforcement. They've taken cancer survivors who had no future fertility because their eggs had been created, with, had been made into embryos with their exes and that man was now vetoing the courts have said, we're sorry, we are not going to force probation. So just think about that in the context of what Dobbs court is telling us. In some cases, the courts have allowed the original agreement between what usually is a husband and a wife to control 
if the agreement was to discard or donate, not to use. So we aren't forcing men to be dads, and Dobbs is, of course, forcing a lot of women unexpectedly and unwantingly to be mothers. The second of the three cases I want to mention to you is a case called Terrell versus Torres. This is an Arizona case, and the reason I cherry pick these three cases is they each stand for something. So Davis, of course, tells us we've got special respect, but you can still discard. Terrell versus Torres is the most sympathetic case you get. Ruby Torres is a cancer, is a cancer patient. She needs to preserve her fertility. She grabs her fiance. They create embryos. They agree that upon divorce, it will be donated unless they agree to use them. So the, here we have the agreement that was missing in Davis versus Davis. We have the disposition. The trial court says, I read, I know, I know how to read a document. I'm a lawyer. You've got to donate. That's what it says. The appeals court feels so badly for Ruby Torres. They said, no, we're going to balance the interest and on balance, she deserves them. The Supreme Court came in and said, sorry, sympathy doesn't apply here. Prior agreement of the two genetic contributors was to donate or and can't use, she loses. The Arizona legislature felt so badly for this woman that they enacted a statute that says upon divorce, the one who wants to use them to bring them to birth should get them, regardless of what they may have agreed to at the time of treatment. Take the agreement, throw it out the window. I talked to Arizona IVF doctors and I asked them, I don't know how you practice here anymore. I don't know what you say to your patients if you hand them this document to sign, which is a contract. Here it is, we're not sure it's worth the paper it's written on. There's a lot of questions about whether it's constitutional, but it has not been a challenge brought yet. Um, there are a lot of nuances to that. We can go into if it's important, if it's of interest to people, the Q&A. But the important thing is the agreement that was so important in Davis and that supposedly elevated people to making decisions about their future product pro procreation is considered irrelevant in Arizona. So, um, Dobbs, so what I want to know now is put on, look at the last third of this, which is what is going to be the impact of Dobbs on the ARTs. And I put this parentheses up there because I want to acknowledge that, first of all, this is a small part of the problem. Obviously, women who can, women and girls who cannot afford or find or get to abortion care is the big problem with Dobbs. But the impact on the ARTs goes beyond maternal and fetal health care anomalies, multiples, ectopic pregnancies. All of those may also be part of the mix. But what I wanted to do, and I thought you all asked me to do, was to talk about specific things that I think Dobbs will do. So first of all, it's idea of frozen embryos. There are personhood laws that have been passed in states that have been many more built, and they say life begins at fertilization. Well, I showed you those pictures. If life begins at fertilization, then I think we have a real problem as to why an embryo does not get the same protection as an incipient pregnancy. Um, we have enhanced liability theory. So in other words, if you're an embryologist and you drop an embryo, you make a mistake, you put it in the wrong person, the tank fails, the electricity failed in two major clinics a couple of years ago. No longer are we talking about um, consumer protection or malpractice. We're talking about wrongful death potentially. Uh, other implications, everybody is talking now on the ground about moving their embryos from red states to blue states. They're terrified they're going to lose control of their IVF embryos, and they're asking their doctors, should I send them to a facility outside of the state of Texas, for example? Um, compassionate transfer is a term which has been used by physicians. I see some of you nodding in which couples are finished with their IVF treatment. They say, put the embryo in at a non-fertile time because I don't want to deal with discard. It hurts, you know, it, it's, it's against my religious beliefs. So compassionate transfer has been a solution that physicians have used. Come in on, an, on, on a time when you're having your period, a time when you know you're not fertile, we'll put them in, the chances of getting pregnant are slim to none. Well, how do you do a compassionate transfer if an embryo is a person who is obviously not going to have the optimal chance of living under Dobbs? Um, so I think that's another one. And then I really worry that a state like Arizona, which we thought was a real outlier, and Louisiana are going to be blueprints for the future. Louisiana has had a provision in their constitution that said embryos are juridical persons available for adoptive implantation. Couples no longer want them. Doctors are guardians until they find a, quote, heterosexual married couple to give them to. Most Louisiana patients send their embryos out of state as soon as they create them. So are we going to see forced procreation? We have this entire line of cases in the RTs that say, no, that's not what we do, especially for men. We protect those guys from being fathers against their will. And now I just think this is going to impact all, everything that patients do going forward. In a worst case scenario, 
I can envision states saying you can't discard your embryos. These are life, they're potential life. And if you don't want them anymore, we'll just turn you into donors. That's fine. Embryo Sue Sophia is this, you know, Sophia Bagara from Family Life. If you want to have some fun, Google what's happening with her and her embryos. Emma and Isabel are two female embryos. Her ex is trying to get them and saying, we'll just turn her into an egg donor. No problem. It's a crazy, crazy case, except that when he lost in California, he went to Louisiana and created a trust for Emma and Isabella. That's my timer for one minute. Um, so that they could inherit the money that he and his lawyer set aside for him. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. I showed you that um, slide where they're pulling out uh, material to test. I'm worried about what that means. Why can we just still do PGT? First of all, we might hurt the embryo. Science says we're not hurting it very badly, risking it, but we might hurt that embryo. So is it for the benefit of an embryo to have it tested? And if what we're going to find out is that it's an affected embryo, well, what difference does it make? Isn't every human life the same as any other? So why would we not have every affected and unaffected embryo available? And if you don't want them, you know, the couple who paid to have all this testing to try to have the perfect child, we will just take those embryos and give them to somebody who cares more, is more deserving, et cetera. A couple of solutions in my last minute. I think there is one path forward here that I've been promoting for a couple of years now, which is that if we freeze eggs and sperm separately, we are protecting autonomy of individuals. We were doing this before Dobbs. Women would not have their eggs mixed with their current partner's sperm and then be under their thumb if they change their minds. We've always frozen sperm. Until 2012, we did not have the non-experimental label to freeze eggs. We have it now. So if we freeze eggs and sperm separately, there are some medical contraindications. There's a question of testing we'll go into the nuances if you care later. But legally, in terms of protecting autonomy and getting ourselves away from the Dobbs spheres, I think the safest thing we can do is freeze gametes. The last thing I want to talk about, I told you, was third-party art. And this is surrogacy. And what are we what we're worrying about on the ground here? This is an old New York Times Sunday Magazine article, Her Body, My Baby. It was roundly criticized for looking like a very classist thing. The intended mother is, of course, wearing heels and the black power dress and her surrogate is dressed in which she said later, I was just comfortable. I was eight months pregnant. But the worry is in surrogacy, we have always said that a pregnant woman is in, is in charge of her own body, that she makes decisions. So no matter what she signs in a contract in the old days, pre dogs we would say, you can say that you will terminate if there is a fetal anomaly, if there is a genetic defect, you will selectively reduce if you have multiples and it doesn't feel safe if the parents want you to. But everyone understands that under Roe v. Wade, a woman controls her own body. Well, that's out the window, right? So does that mean parents can now direct, the intended parents can direct what happens with this pregnancy, except of course, they also can't abort because no one can. So I think it's going to really change the balance. What we're seeing on the ground right now is lawyers running around trying to figure out how to change the contracts, what to do about this, whether to put um, choice of law provisions in, whether they're going to be enforceable. Red states, coincidentally, with a lower standard of living typically, have been very fertile grounds, no pun intended, for surrogates. Texas is a huge source of surrogates. We're seeing a shift towards blue states because people are afraid of the red states. On the other hand, blue states usually have a higher standard of living. We're now, I'm hearing on the ground, for example, in Massachusetts, where I practiced for years, um, using public assistance and single moms because that brings down the cost. And of course, those of you who study this field know that if you're on public assistance, you have to have an income eligibility cap and your surrogacy fee is probably gonna tip you over. So no one is calling the fee a fee. So I think there are lots of potential worries in the surrogacy field. Last two slides, state laws. Um, is there a carve out or can there be a carve out for IVF and ART? I think the answer is maybe because most of these statutes are talking about pregnancy termination for the penalties. So they are not immediately going to apply. On the other hand, it's hard to believe that they aren't going to be extended by some aggressive prosecutor somewhere when we're talking about life begins at fertilization. And then there's this beautiful quote from Professor Lisa Ikamoto from UC Davis, where she says, how ironic is it that we are not going to any longer protect pregnancy, you know, women carrying a pregnancy, but there's a carve out for an embryo that's not yet in a woman's body. So there's nothing to balance against. We're gonna protect the unbalanced against the ones we're rebalancing. So the last case is in remarriage of Rooks. I just wanna leave you with this worry. Um, this was a 2018 divorcing embryo case. The bottom line is the following. The Colorado Supreme Court said that unless there was a written record, 
they were going to balance the constitutional rights. And they cited Davis, just like we discussed. The, if you haven't heard of the Thomas More Society, they are coming in and being amicus on almost all of these cases. And they argued, and they filed a brief to the Supreme, they, they filed for cert, that science is firm on when a person comes into being, which was a little bit startling to all of us in the field, that IVM F embryos are not persons that that in-between classification should be tossed out the window. And they urged the Supreme Court to decide on a national constitutional level whether the most basic human question is a human embryo, a person, or property. And I just would find myself wondering four years later, post Dobbs, what would happen if that case came back to the Supreme Court. So thank you so much for listening. Like we all need to take a deep breath or <laughs> speak for myself. And Susan, I would like to send you to testify at every state legislature that is considering uh, some of just with your petri dish slides and what an incredibly clear explanation of how complex this is. This idea, I, I mean, it's it's reminding me of the majority's decision in Dobbs of like this will be so simple. Yeah. Oh, you thought Roe and Casey were unworkable and created all this litigation. You just wait. And the dissent laid that out so well. But I, I just hearing your description of so many issues that I were not on my radar, unbelievable. Um, so thank you. I what an incredible panel. Um, let's just do it. Another... Over. Um, I know we've gotten some questions online. Maybe we'll start here in the room if someone has anything to tee up right away. If not, we've got more than enough to get us started. Please. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Alan, I'm an LLM student, uh, and I come from Kenya, so I'm not very familiar with the context of the U.S. courts, but I'd want to understand, for the readings I've done, I've not seen any Supreme Court judgment mention international instruments, so what utility is it to American lawyers, noting that A, the court doesn't seem to care about it, B, the U.S. has not ratified any of the treaties, so what is the utility of international law? And linked to that, what would be the utility of an amicus brief that comes, that speaks to issues of international law and uh, the obligations countries have? And since we're speaking about the path way forward, I know many of us may have any strategies politically because the Supreme Court is it. it is what it is right now. If the judges don't change, I'm sure if another case when before the military is organized to help the American constitution, so every state should start participating. So is there a political angle being taken to address that? Because the law cannot deal with the politics. I just want to hear that. Various issues of health. So would be interested to know how we can help countries. Yeah, just some small questions that you teed up for our panel. Perfect. Um, Rebecca, we might start with you. I know this was something that you were going to talk about that maybe you didn't get to right away. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that that really tees up this idea that while these obligations may exist on, on paper under certain treaties, um, enforcement is, is very difficult because of the limited weight these arguments carry within the domestic legal structure. Um, the, I think Sylvia mentioned that in Latin America, countries have signed on to optional protocols that allow for individual complaint mechanisms, which have you know, a stronger enforcement mechanism, uh, even though technically those, the results of those are, are not binding the recommendations. But yeah, it means that the, the, the processes that the US can be brought to through the international human rights system are very limited and result in, in recommendations that the US can choose to follow or not. Um, they participate in the, the processes, the country review processes, um, and we see civil society actively participating in terms of providing shadow reports and things like that. So there is interest on the U.S. side to participate in these processes, but then when it comes to actually informing what arguments courts use, I agree with you 100% that we don't have a strong tradition of that. And the example that I like to use is that we used to have, um, uh, there, was a, there was a federal law prohibiting FGMC, and that was um, an issue that is not as controversial as abortion that um, had been grounded in the idea that the U.S. had signed on to certain international human rights treaties, including the ICCPR, 
and the right to non-discrimination contained therein provided authority for the federal government to regulate that issue. That uh, law was ruled unconstitutional in the federal courts because they didn't even see a sufficient connection between the issue of FGMC and the right to non-discrimination. Um, and so there needed to be a different avenue for justifying the federal government regulating that issue. And if we can't even use the human rights framework to come to a consensus on an issue like that, where there is much less division, much, much less divisiveness, um, I do think that, that oftentimes what we're talking about when we think about using human rights arguments in the US context is not for, for normative um, argumentation. It is to potentially hope that, that the political pressure and the, the idea that the world is watching, that we aren't being compared to, to other countries who have other standards in place, maybe has an effect on, on some judges, not all, certainly. Um, and I will say, I don't know if you saw this, but one thing is the, the role of international human rights law within the US courts and US legislatures. The other is comparative law. And I don't, when, when, when um, Lindsey Graham announced the federal uh, abortion ban, in the background of a number of the photos, it listed basically what other countries' gestational limits are. They were comparing the US to where other countries are on this issue. And that is something that was brought up in a number of amicus briefs, and I believe in the majority opinion. So I think when it is to the benefit of the side in terms of what they're trying to achieve, yes, there are decision makers, whether it's judges or legislators who will rely on comparative law, and maybe even some human rights arguments. We haven't seen it yet permeate the culture of you know, legal um, judges in particular, but it, it may change when it is to their advantage, so. Yeah, please. Yes, no, I, I agree with, with Rebecca um, that the, the utility of international human rights law cannot be measured only in terms of how many times um, domestic courts use or quote um, international standards. Um, I, one thing that I, from my experience in the, in the inter-American system with the United States, is that um, well, not during uh, the Trump administration, but with the Obama administration, the United States uh, engages at least. Uh, the United States engages, participates in the in the processes, and uh, in those processes, the different type of mechanisms that one can um, access in the context of the inter-American system, they make at least visible some issues. Um, some of the main issues uh, in the United States the human rights issues uh, in the United States that have been brought by uh, law clinics, by civil society, and that may, or at least there is a correlation, I'm not saying causation, but at least a correlation in terms of the debate within the national um, arena are uh, migration issues, Guantanamo, death penalty, uh, police brutality, and racial profiling. Those are the four um, main issues um, in the context if, if one see all the cases decided by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights with respect to the United States. And these are issues in which there has been there, there have been some changes in the in the in the past years. Since I, I was uh, taking notes here, but since 2009, uh, at least seven states abolished the penalty. And that, that was at the same time in which the human rights movement made um, visible in terms of cases and in terms of other types of, of international advocacy, the, the problems of the application of death penalty in the United States, the human rights problems. So I um, I wouldn't measure the, the, the utility in terms only of the formal um, incorporation of international human rights law, but in terms of engagement of making problems visible. Making this problem visible is a paradox in the United States, because as you know, one of the excuses of the United States not to ratify the American Convention on Human Rights is that uh, it had a very uh, wide protection on abortion. So uh, bringing these, the, the fact that this the human rights movement will bring these issues to the international bodies is a, is a paradox in, in those terms. And I understand the second half of your question is sort of be like, what do we do next? Which might be how we end, but I did not forget that part. Um, I guess one question that we've seen come in um, from which audience, and, and Susan, this gets to your point of some of the, the changes, uh, even as you were talking about IVF, I was thinking about medication abortion, which also I think maybe existed, but certainly wasn't approved in the United States until 2000, long after Roe 
I was sort of curious, uh, sort of across the panel, like, especially in the international community, are these restricted? Do we have better arguments on medication abortion? Right in the United States, more than half of all abortions right now are done using medication abortion. There's telemedicine access. I think this is a coming fight. States have tried to step in. I just don't know if there are any distinctions that you all would make or that you've seen in terms of legal arguments or otherwise between sort of procedural abortion versus medication abortion or, or any sort of um, additional kind of innovations or developments that you think are coming down the pike that might raise similar questions. of the right to medicine or something helps <laughs> on medication abortion, but maybe. I mean, there are, there are some avenues um, internationally that uh, other countries have explored, you know, thinking about abortion medication as an essential medicine, it should be on right. essential med medicines list that, that exists internationally and where there's more, you know, influence from, from the international community over a, a a given country's activities that could carry some weight. Um, the WHO has issued recent recommendations about what is appropriate around medication abortion. The U.S. doesn't even get quite to that point in terms of the duration of time that it's recommended for. Um, but uh, again, I, I, I sort of this, whether the U.S. with its exceptionalism is subject to, to some of those pressures um, and mechanisms. Um, but I'm going to ref reflect more on sort of the legal arguments because basically in terms of what's happening in the U.S., it feels like there is no distinction really when it comes to the abortion bans, whether we're talking about surgical abortions or medication abortions, the complications around the fact that medication abortion is also used for miscarriage management brings up some of those same legal and ethical dilemmas for physicians and for pharmacists who are not willing to prescribe unless they know that this is for sure for a miscarriage rather than for an abortion. Do you have a doctor write that in the prescription? I mean, it can be very complicated in practice. Um, but yeah. on, on a practical level, what I've also heard is that, you know, if people are staying within states that do not have the bans, it is an advantage on their getting the mobile um, places sitting on the borders, if you will, because of the fear of mailing into a red state. On the other, and there are states, that, and I understand their colleagues working on protecting physicians from being prosecuted if they engage in mail-in, but then I've heard as a counter argument that they, they, they may be legally protected, but the insurance, their malpractice carriers are coming in and making them vulnerable too. So I do think it's, there is some potential hope, but it's fraught with a lot of practical problems. And the, the last thing about medication abortion is that it doesn't necessarily require the involvement of the formal health system. And so there are other countries that have developed very comprehensive networks to support women in accessing medication abortions without the involvement of health providers, legal or otherwise. And some of those models are now being replicated in the US, particularly in Southern states. Um, but I do think it's important to note that even that within Latin America and within the US, you have differences of opinion among medical providers about whether self-managed abortion without interaction with the health system is really the way to go. Is that the gold standard we should be pushing for? Is it a harm reduction model? Because there, there are people and there are patients who would prefer to navigate these services within the confines of, of, a, of a health system because that's just part of the, the culture around seeking health services. So it's sort of a complicated um, piece where you say, maybe it's easier, maybe you can avoid the physician liability though aiding and abetting means many other people can be subject to it, but uh, there are also complications to, to negotiate with the health professional community in the process. And I think some of those international suppliers, even our FDA is trying to shut them down when you have medication abortion being shipped from the Denmark. Um, yeah. Other questions for folks in the room? going. I get um, maybe Sylvia to start with you. I think how has the Dobbs decision sort of changed? Maybe it hasn't changed your work, but what, what do you see from the ground in terms of partnerships between, if at all, U.S.-based organizations, international organizations? Is your sense that this is having downstream implications for other countries? Do we expect other countries to change their laws in reaction to Dobbs? Any sort of trickle out effect from the United States, I think, would be interesting. Yes. Um, well, basically, my my main presentation, my, the, the objective of my presentation was try to to say that we're far from 
this type of retrogression because we have a legal framework that at least formally is um, stronger in, in terms of uh, the ways in which you can protect the advance, the, the progress in, in terms of abortion. However, um, there's always inspiration for those who want to, to limit and to restrict rights. Um, and we've seen some um, arguments, for example, right now in Argentina, there are um, the, the law that, that decriminalizes abortion until week 14 um, is facing uh, constitutional challenges, uh, at least almost 40 um, constitutional, uh, almost 40 judicial cases, mainly constitutional challenges to the to the law. And some uh, some of the of those arguments are trying to misuse Dobbs. Um, I don't think Dobbs has legal implications because what they're trying to say is that um, the law is unconstitutional and that's not what the, what the Supreme Court of the United States says, said, but uh, there is a misuse of Dobbs. Uh, we, we saw another type of misuse in Brazil in the context of a public hearing regarding um, a protocol uh, on the part of the Ministry of Health where some people were saying, well, now that we have Dobbs, uh, we're going to do this and that. And I, we, we've seen a lot of misinformation and misuse, and that's why I think that um, advocates in Latin America should be uh, very strict in stating every time what are not the legal implications of DOPS in the context of, of Latin America. Um, another thing that we've seen, but I, don't, I, I wouldn't connect that with DOPS, but with, with actually with the, with the trend of, the criminal, of progressive decriminalization is the sophistication of criminalization. And I think that's a phenomenon that it's taking place right now in the United States and also in Latin America. In the United States, maybe as a consequence of DOPS, in Latin America, maybe as a response to the, um, to the, to the progressive decriminalization of, of abortion. So now they're using um, criminal, um, some uh, uh, different ways in which they're sophisticating and including um, uh, non-medical personnel who are supporting or who, who are uh, accompanying women to, to, to provide abortion. So there are some um, contexts that may be similar and from which we, we can learn from, from each other. Uh, and one of those that I forgot to mention is the sophistication and the, the, the creative new ways in which you can criminalize um, abortion or things that are not actual uh, voluntary abortions, but other things, but still people end up in, in jail for that. And about the, the partnerships, I would give, give Rebecca to answer. Potential um. partnerships potential partnerships um, with local actors and in other parts of the world? Uh, you know, is the U.S. taking up more bandwidth maybe for international organizations working on this issue? Perhaps, right. Just, I don't know. Are there shifting dynamics? Um, this was an audience question, so you can feel free to clarify. But sort of, has there been an impact of maybe where the focus had been or shifts in that? Sure. Degree? I mean, I think there's always concern about funding streams. And now it's all we're, always been very segmented where you have funders funding either domestic repro work or global repro work and maybe not talking to each other and then there's only one pot of funding so it only goes to one or the other and that there may be some reactions within the donor community that more emphasis will, will go towards um, work, work in the U.S. given in reaction to what's been happening and also tied to the idea that there have been all these gains that have happened in countries in Latin America that that maybe it feels like they have their own momentum, but but that's because there has been a lot of investment of resources and um, technical assistance and all kinds of support that these these initiatives and changes don't happen in a vacuum and, and the result of, of years of work. So I think yes, I think we've heard from partners anxiety about what this means because the U.S. does carry a lot of weight in terms of what its um, precedent sets. Um, in terms of the global community. Uh, but I, I think this is, we work, work, people who work on these issues are used to working in a pendulum. And so it's sort of reacting to the next potential wave of, of backlash, which was already coming following the, the recent gains in Argentina, Colombia, Mexico. So sort of add it, add it to the list of things to worry about and, and work against. <laughs> working on a pendulum is well said. That was a very <laughs> good description of has been going. Um, so I might do last call for questions in the room. I think we one last question oh, here. Yeah. So so what next? What what does what should 
the movement of feminists, women's rights activists in the US, what should they do to kind of pick up the fight again? Because clearly there is need for much stronger legal protections than existed, well, than we thought existed, right? Something protected from this kind of judicial activism that just, you know, one, one court's makeup, one court's leaning is what determines whether or not in this era or the next or the next women get access to their rights. Perfect question, Emma. Whoever wants to take that one, <laughs> just start. What should we be doing next, I think, is the question. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. Um, so I think three things. I mean, I know you'll see a lot of people say, go out and vote, which I think uh, for US citizens and people who are able to vote here, that's great, but we have a lot of issues with our voting rights and that can feel like a, a futile answer to, to these bigger questions where we know that decision makers are the ones ultimately in power here because of our systems of, of uh, uh, power and how, how it's all set up. So I would say a, a couple of things. One, we know that the Dobbs decision was the result of a decades long strategy by the opposition to get to this point and to reshape the federal courts, the Supreme Court, et cetera. I think folks who care about reproductive justice need to come together. And I don't know if this is happening, if there are great minds thinking about how to do this, to mobilize the judiciary, to be more progressive on these issues, to move away from originalism, to think about how our constitution can evolve and not just be based in what the folks were thinking when they wrote the, the words that, that are included in that document hundreds of years ago. Um, but that that's a decades long uh, endeavor that requires a lot of systemic work and uh, structural change, structural changes. Um, the other thing I would say is, I was blanking on the second one. I think we are now in a position in the US where the this is very much going to be a state by state um, regulatory um, experience. And that means that I think a lot of the work needs to be done at the state level and what works in one state is not necessarily gonna work in another state. I think a lot of people looked at what happened in Kansas and said, let's do a referendum. We know referendums can also be dangerous in terms of the types of things that can be put to a vote, the popular vote. Um, so there are limitations associated with that, but it worked for Kansas. So thinking about what are the right initiatives on a state-by-state -state basis. And then the last thing was it was more around the movement. And I think this is where the human rights community and the human rights language it can be an effective mobilizing tool is to rethink how the reproductive rights, reproductive health, reproductive justice movement has worked in this country because it has been very top down. It has been very hierarchical. It has had certain type of people in leadership positions. So really to diversify that movement. Um, and I think that's been happening, but there's a lot more work to be done um, to ensure that we have the people who are most affected by this ruling are at the, the table and the ones leading all the mobilization that people need to be done. That's a much better answer than I would give. I was just going to say that I'm hearing these really unexpected, interesting inklings that, you know, the dog that caught the car and that there are Republican candidates in states who are afraid that this is going to hurt them in the midterms. And that while initially there was expected to be a tremendous amount of legislation, that there's some backpedaling happening, which I think was at least on a, you know, very mildly encouraging that they don't, you know, they want to wait till after the midterm. So then I think some of it is mobilizing to capture that public antipathy that has happened to this decision. and. Um, you know, and we also need to work on the state on the state at the state level. I think we have to work on local offices. I think we really need to get very granular within the United States on um, understanding that that's where a lot of the power decisions are coming up from. Yes, well, I would I would just add that um, I agree that the debate now is political and it's in the legislatures of states. 
Um, and in that context, I think that um, the restrictive laws in each state will be based on an intention to protect life. And um, that um, argument can be um, challenged uh, in abstract in an abstract way, but it can also be challenged with data and with information. So I think that um, the, the I, I will not underestimate the role of data and information to support advocacy efforts in the political context in terms of the public health impacts of bans, how that protection of life is not um, it's not real because um, not only you're not protecting the, the embryos or the fetuses, you are also pushing uh, women to unsafe um, abortions. So um, the, public, the, the, the data on public health impacts of bans um, the, the impacts of the restrictive laws in access to healthcare in general, not only for abortion. So that information must be uh, gathered and must be public um, in order to create at least um, political and social support to the, to the advocacy um, efforts and also the, the disparate impacts of uh, criminalization, which is um, a reality, not only in the United States, but, but in the world. Um, and I would just give it, I would add to this uh, um, cocktail, I will add, I, I will give, give a try to strengthen uh, international advocacy with respect to reproductive health in the United States. Uh, it's not usual, it's not because it, it was not uh, one of the main issues, but um, it, it is now the time. Uh, it has had some impact uh, in migration issues. It has had some impact in terms of death penalty. Well, now this is a human rights issue and I will give it a try to international advocacy. Can't think of a better way to end. Please join me in thanking this incredible panel and the human rights. <laughs>